Well, last week I started talking about what we want for our church, which should be our vision, which should be our expectation, our hope, our desire as a church uh, in 2023. I know that all of us have desires for this year, uh, especially when we talk about gathering. Uh, people think about all kinds of things. Uh, for some of you, you are thinking of uh, family, you're thinking of uh, finances, and you're thinking of your business or, or something that relates directly to you. And that is okay. Each one of us must personalize the theme for the year and, and work towards something tangible, something real, something life transforming. But as a church, as a church together, as a church body, as a local church here at Christ Temple, it's important that we also think of what do we want as a church? What do we, when we say gathering, what does it mean for us as a church? What should it mean for us? Not just as individuals alone, but as a local church, as a body. And that's what uh, I've, I started talking about last week. And I will do the part two of my message um, which I started last week, what we want for our church in 2023, and this is part two. And we will go to our theme verse for the year. I suppose you know what our theme verse is for the year. What is the theme verse? John chapter 6. Okay, memorize it, memorize it. The mic will be coming to you one of these Sundays. Memorize it. So John chapter 6 verse 12. And it reads, So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost, or that nothing may be Lost, And that's why Jesus told them to gather up the pieces after they had eaten so that nothing will be lost. And that is our uh, expectation for this year for every member that nothing may be lost. And it's our mission as a church for the whole of 2023. We want to make this a reality in our lives as a local church that nothing may be lost. And when we talk about nothing may be lost, we are talking in terms of people, not just in terms of things and property and items, but in terms of people. And last week I spoke about the problems we must resolve in the lives of people in the church. We talked about the problem of sinfulness, of self-centeredness, of skepticism, uh, where people are in the church, but their hearts are so far away from God, and they don't believe in the truth of God and apply it to their word, their lives. And we talk about suffering, people going through pain and difficulty, and how all of these things impact on lostness. So when and we say that people are lost, there are things that make them feel lost. And uh, those are some of the things. And what we must do as a church is find a way... Of, of becoming a church that helps people to deal with all of these things. So somebody here comes to church and he's having a problem with sin. We should be able to help the person to overcome. Somebody is just self-centered and selfish. We should be able to help them to become more caring and sharing. If somebody comes here, he's a skeptic. We must help them to have a healthy faith in God, true passion for God, true love for God. And people come here and they are suffering and going through pain. We must help them to overcome their pain and their suffering or deal with it in a far better way than they would without Christ. So that is what we want to be able to do uh, <clears throat> in the church. There are two main groups of people whom I consider lost. And I'll talk about the two Groups. The first one uh, will be likened from First John chapter five verse twelve. First John chapter five verse twelve. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The first group of people uh, that we consider to be lost are those who are without Christ and are separated from His life. We normally call those people unbelievers. Or we call them unsaved people. Or 
or we, we call them sinners, uh, however we call them, the essential thing is that uh, they are separated from the life of Christ. They don't have the life of Christ in them. And that is the state in which every human being is born. So that's the first group of people. The, they, they don't have Christ, they are not born again, uh, and they don't enjoy the newness of life. And there are many people like that. Some are caught in wrong belief systems, so they are practicing wrong beliefs. Some are driven by a life of pleasure, have no space for God. And a lot of our young people are caught up in that situation, in alcohol, in drugs, in sex, in gambling. Some are self-righteous people who believe they can save themselves. And they, and they have no need for any redeemer or savior. And we see a lot of people like that in our world. Others are caught up in all kinds of wrong, liberal, hyper-liberal worldviews uh, where anything goes and they live for anything and anyhow. Others have made signs they are God and they think they've become so scientific that they have no need of God. And these are the populations of those who do not have the life of Christ in them. There's so many different things that separates people from the life of Christ. And, and that's the first group of people I consider lost. Most of these people are not in church. They don't attend church. They, they, they don't care about God. They don't care about the things of God. Or, or even if they do care about the things of God in a wrong way and not through Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's the first category uh, of lost people that we must be dealing with. Then there is a second group who are lost and they are represented in uh, an incident that happened in Matthew chapter 28 verse 25. Jesus is in a boat with his disciples and they're going through a storm. And you know that story. And Jesus is asleep at the bottom part of the boat and they're going through the storm. And, and when the storm gets very severe, they remember Jesus is with them. And, and so they go to him and, and try to get his attention. So this is what the passage reads, Matthew chapter 8, verse 25. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, for we are perishing. Or we are being lost, we are perishing. So, the first group I describe are those who are without Christ. But the second group are those who are with Christ, but feel separated from Him. They are with Him, but they are separated from Him. And that's how it fell for the disciples when they were in that boat. They were with Christ. He was with them. But they tried by their own effort to try and get themselves out of the mess they were in. And then when they, they, they went to wake him up, they woke him up with an accusation. Lord, you don't care. You don't care, Lord. You don't even know what I'm going through, Lord. You don't know what I'm suffering. So these are people who are with Christ, but they feel separated, distant from Christ. And these are normally church people. Born again Christians. They go to church. They serve in the church. They attend church probably every Sunday. They may even be pastors or pastor's wives or pastor's children. Born in the church. Dedicated in the church. Going through all the processes. Baptized. Yet, they feel distanced from the Lord Jesus Christ. They are with him in fellowship, but distant from him. And a lot of people sitting here feel like that. You are in church, all right. You are in the boat with Jesus, all right. But sometimes you feel he doesn't care for you. Or you feel that, yeah, you are in the boat with him, but you can live your own life. There are many who have given their lives to Christ. But certainly they are not living for Jesus Christ. Some Christians are following wrong religious beliefs. It's amazing. 
that Christians can't sometimes tell the difference between Christian doctrine and other doctrines. And we mix up everything. We mix up Hinduism and Buddhism and into Christianity and, and all kinds of isms. And we don't even know that an idea that we are talking about, you know, I, I hear people talk about karma. And they talk about it as if uh, it's a Christian thought. It's a, it's a Hindu thought. It is wrapped up in a belief system that is not Christian. Of course, there is sowing and reaping in Christianity, but that's not karma. And if you don't know the difference, you are going to be a Christian. Go to church, but you believe wrong. No wonder you feel distant from the Lord. You feel far away. And there are Christians who are Christians, but they are Buddhists also. Christians, but uh, uh, Muslims also. Christians, but African traditional practitioners also. They believe their grandfather can still speak to them. They believe their ancestors can still channel messages to them. One of the things I've, I've seen people do, you know, when a loved one dies, people will go and say, oh, yeah, maybe it's your mother. They say, she's now become an angel. Oh, oh, my friend is now, go and watch over us wherever you are. Where did you get that belief from? Where did you get that? That your mother can still watch over you wherever she is? Where is that? Of course that is not Christianity. That's not Christianity. That's not Bible Christianity. It can be African traditional religion. And sometimes when we don't know the difference, Christianity is mixed up with African traditionalism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and still we are Christians. And somehow it's not working. So you feel like, this Christianity at all, I don't know whether it works or not. You feel distant from the Lord. So you are in Christ but lost. And then there are people outside of Christ who still feel lost. And my desire, and I hope it, you can share in that desire, is that this year we must do everything we can to reach these two groups of people. Those lost outside, those lost inside. And we must do everything to help people to connect with Jesus Christ in a deeper and more profound way. So, arising out of this, there are two implications arising from these two conditions. The first one is an outreach implication. Outreach means we are reaching out. For those who are not in Christ, Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. So there is an outreach implication. There is something we must do as a church to reach out to people. To go beyond our church's walls. To go beyond our group and reach out to people. That's an outreach implication. And when we do that, what are we doing? We are doing outreach to share the gospel. To share the gospel. So, as a church, there must be an outreach. We can share the gospel as a church, as individuals. But we must also share it as a group. And our church... ICGC, but particularly here at Christ Temple, shares the gospel in an outreach through media broadcast. These days, television, radio, social media are the most effective ways to spread information to people. That's the most effective way. You know, when I was growing up, if you wanted to preach the gospel... There were many ways to do that, and we, we would do uh, something called dawn broadcast. We'll get up at dawn and go around people's homes and preach the gospel, not their homes, but the community, and, and just preach. Or you hold crusades where you mount a platform, put on loudspeakers, and people come and sing, normally with a tambourine, and they would jiggle and jiggle and jiggle, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. People gather, somebody preaches, they come to Christ. And it is a valid way of outreach. But the world we live in now has moved beyond that. 
the most effective way to mass produce any message, television, radio, social media. And increasingly, social media is becoming a far more effective way of broadcasting a message. That means whilst we appreciate the old methods of doing things, we must appreciate the new opportunities that God is opening to us. The reason you have WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok is not just for you to take pictures of you wearing blue shirt and blue dress and post it online. Oh, this is what I ate for lunch. Who cares what you ate for lunch? But have you considered that your Facebook, your WhatsApp, all of these can be used to press, preach the gospel? It's not for personal entertainment. And as a church, that is where our strength is. For many years, We've been on television. I started preaching on television in 1987. The first Christian to do a Christian broadcast on on television after uh, a very long period of time uh, when the PNDC uh, had banned broadcasting of Christian messages. Thank God for whoever that guy was. (laughs) But it wasn't possible to do that. In 87, I preached... On, on, on television. And when TV opened properly, we were the first to be on radio, the first to be on TV. And, and we have always been the first in the media, in social media, Facebook. When the lockdown came, we were the first doing that. We started reaching out. What do you think that was happening? It is outreach. It may not be a crusade with a platform, but you reach far more people on radio, on television, and social media than any other medium in this present world. And if Jesus Christ was alive today, I'm sure he'll be on television, he'll be on radio, he'll be on social media, what's up in his messages. He would have done that. He said, whatever I say to you in secret, shout it upon the housetop. So as a church, we must be mindful of how we are reaching people. And each member must ask, what am I doing in this church to enhance? And that's why we need people to partner the church and support the church. Let's buy radio time and television time and expand social media and push the message of the gospel as far as possible. There's an outreach implication of reaching people, sharing the gospel. And in doing that, maybe what some of you may do is just invite people to church. So we must become a welcoming church. We must be a friendly church. If we want people outside to come in, we must be nice, smile, be respectful, be courteous, not judgmental against people who come to church. You know, sometimes church people are very finicky. And sometimes, especially the older members of the church who lived in a different age where every Christian comported themselves, wore the hair a style, wore the same kaba to church. And, and, and it was a certain age, and that is appreciated, and we thank God for that age. But there is a different age now. And those people are not Kaba people. You know, they are a different kind of people. And when they are coming to church, we must not make church their enemy. We must bring them in. When they know Christ, they will comport their behavior to reflect their Christian faith. We must be a welcoming church. That is our outreach. But there is also an enrich, an enrich implication. Enrich is basically reaching those who are inside. Christians who feel separated from God. How do we reach people? We do that by making disciples for Christ. People who come to church must know Jesus Christ. These days, most churches want people to be loyal to the church and loyal to the pastor. But here, I don't even 
My priority is not loyalty to the church and loyalty to me. My priority is loyalty to Christ. Because if you get it right with Christ, you will get it right with everything else. If you love Christ, you will love his church. You will love his people. So let's get people to fall in love with Christ. We have to disciple people. And so we're going to open many avenues for people to study the Bible and to grow in the Lord and to know him and to have an encounter with him. And we must be a caring church. A caring church is one where each member feels connected to each other. So how do we reach to these Two groups. What must we do? If we're going to reach to those who are outside, those who are inside, both connected from, disconnected from Christ, how do we do it? Well, we'll go back to our text, but look at the next verse, John chapter 6, verse 13. The theme is verse 12, but verse 13 says, therefore they gathered them up When Jesus said, gather up the fragments, they did gather up the fragments and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. How do we reach to people? We must gather into baskets. We must gather into baskets. I don't know why they gathered into 12. Many people postulate different reasons. I generally don't try to say what the scripture is not saying. So when something is done and an explanation is not given, I may give an opinion and I will always issue a caveat. This is how, what I think might have happened. I mean, practically, 12 represents two things, both in Israel and in Christ. Israel had 12 tribes. That is how the nation of Israel was divided. So for you to belong to Israel, you have to belong to one of the tribes. You don't just say, I'm an Israelite. Which tribe? No tribe. No tribe. No, you have to belong to one uh, one of the tribes. So uh, the, the, the nation is the whole. The tribe is a subgroup. Is a subgroup. So I think being Jews, probably that was what they were demonstrating, that These things we are gathering together belong to one big family. But in order to belong to one big family, they have to be part of a smaller group of the big family. And I think that is what it meant. But don't quote me on it. This is just my thought on it because there's no explanation note on that verse. So that's how I can see it. So... What does it mean that we must gather into baskets? In my opinion, it means that we do not gather everything into one group. You don't just belong to the big church. This church is big. But we must gather into small groups. What does it mean? It means each member belonging to a small group in the church. Each member belonging to a small group in the church. Our church is a large church. We've been a large church for a very, very long time. From as far back as 1986, we were a big church. We've been a big church for the life of this year. We were a small church for a very small time and we exploded from 1986. And we've never been a small church. It's always been a big church. It's always been a big church. And a big church has a lot of advantages. One of the advantages of a big church is that it can do big things. It can do big things like have, you know, cross over at the Accra Sports Stadium and fill it. Or have greater works at Independence Square and fill it to overflow. That's, if you're a small church, you can do that. You can be on radio, you can be on TV. That's the advantage of being a big church. You can build a big sanctuary like this one. 
That's the advantage. But it has a disadvantage. That a big church can do all these big things, but people can also feel lost in a big church. So, whilst we celebrate our advantage, we must also see the disadvantage. And we must manage the disadvantage, not stop the advantage, but manage the disadvantage. And the only way to be in a big church like this and feel that you are not lost is that you must be in a basket. You must be in a basket. You must be in a small group. And the small group can come in different forms. They can come uh, if you even belong to the praise and worship team. That's a small group. You find it's easier to build friendships and relationships. You know, you come to church, you need money for trans- uh, transport. Uh, you just say, Charlie, can you give me some? Can you get me Uber? Can I join on your Uber home? You know, because they are your friends. But if you don't belong to a small group, you come here, you don't have money for transport, you walk home alone. If you're in the choir, that's a small group. You're in the band, that's a small group. You are in the ushers, you are in the greeters, you are in any department of the church. That is a basket of the church. You're in a covenant family. That's, that's a basket. So a, a big church's strength is not only in its size, but in the baskets it creates to gather fragments into. If we're going to be an effective church, then one of the things we must ensure is that everybody in the big church must be part of a small group. There must be at least 12 people in this church you know who know you too. 12 people, at least, whom you know. You know by name and they know you. And after church, they will look out for you. And after church, you look out for them. And that if you don't come to church next week, they will call you. If you have, don't have that, then you are not in a basket. You are still the fragment on the ground. But we must gather you and find a basket and put you inside. And say, you belong to this basket. This is how we gather. We don't gather into one heap. We gather into small groups so that everybody who has been gathered, everybody, every fragment will feel, I belong somewhere. There are people who think about me. There are people who care about me. I cannot know everybody's name. It's a statistical and physical impossibility. I can't. But the church must know you. Not just as a name on a paper or data in our files, but as a human being who shows up, who has needs, who has concerns. We must know you and the only way to know you is that you must belong to a small group. And later we're going to introduce all the many small groups. We have small groups for women, small groups for men, small groups based on age groups, small groups based on interest groups. We have people, you know, all kinds of things. People with different artistic desires who say they have a small art group, small reading group, small music group, small whatever group. And the more small groups we have, the more effective for people not to feel lost. So all of you who only show up on Sunday and go home after Sunday... We have good plans for you. All right. We love you so much. We have a basket with your name on it. And we'll put you in that basket. Everybody must belong to a small group in the church. Secondly, each member must receive spiritual care and nurturing. Each member must receive spiritual care and nurturing. And that is possible if we belong to a small group. The church is both a learning center and a support center. Our faith must be nurtured. Our social needs must be supported. We must find a way to answer people's questions and respond to those who are suffering. But if you're suffering without being in a basket, nobody would know you are suffering. 
And although we may want to help, we can't even know you are suffering for us to help you. So you must belong to a group that can identify your need and then we can find ways of ministering to people. And the third thing on the gathering to baskets is that each member must function as part of the body of Christ. Each member must participate. Each member must do something. You don't just be come to church and just come to church. You must be a blessing, not a burden. Each one of us, every one of us carries both burden and blessing. The burden is our problem. The blessing is our gift. And the fact that you have problems doesn't mean you have nothing to contribute. The fact that you have something to contribute doesn't mean you have no problems. So both your burdens and your blessing must be ministered to. And that happens in a small group where each member functions as part of the body of Christ. So, as your pastor, this is what I want to see in our church in 2023. If you agree with it, then let's do it together and let us create a church where these things happen so that at the end of the year, I don't want us to say we gathered cars and we gathered money and we gathered this and we, I just want us to be able to say we found every church member, those who are lost within and we put them into baskets and they were taught the word of God and they grew closer to the Lord and they began to know the Lord and they knew how to serve God and, and people who don't, who don't know how to pray learned how to pray. People who don't know how to study the Bible, Bible are able to study the Bible. People who are suffering quietly and silently have people who stand with them in prayer and encouragement through their difficulty. That is the testimony I'm waiting for on 31st December 2023. That's what I'm looking for and that's what I want to see in this church and I hope that's what you want to see and we all must commit to this and pray that God will help us to build a church that is able to gather people into baskets so they can be ministered to, cared for, encouraged, and disciple to grow more and more to be Christ-like. Amen. Well, before we take the offering, I think it's good for us to just talk to the Lord. And uh, you are already... In the big group. But I want you to pray and say, Lord, help me to be part of a smaller group. Let me build a network in this church. Help me, Lord, to connect with you deeper. I want to know you more. I want to know the Bible better. I want to know your word better. I want to be more spiritual. I, I want to be more biblical. If that's your desire, I believe we are on a good journey this year. And, and God is going to help us to build a very healthy in a good church. Why don't you lift up your hands to the Lord and talk to the Lord about your part in this vision. Your part. If you want to help the church to reach out more through radio and television and its social media outlets, just let God use you. Let God use you. Some of those things cost a lot of money to do. You don't want to be just someone who comes to church and leaves after service without talking to anybody, no friend, no relationship. Help us, Lord, to find a group, a basket we can belong to, a group we can be nurtured in, a fellowship we can grow in. And help us, Lord, more and more to live for you as your children in this house. To glorify your name, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. And I pray that when the time comes, each one of you will participate in the process of creating this church that we want to see in 2023.